Welcome to the Victorious Living Podcast. You're about to hear real stories of real people who have discovered the real hope of Jesus Christ. I'm Christy Overton Johnson, the founder and publisher of Victorious Living Magazine. Since 2011, I've had the privilege of sharing the most amazing life stories. I never cease to be amazed at the life-transforming power of Jesus Christ. Today in our podcast, you're going to go deeper into these amazing God stories and hear from those who have overcome incredible odds and discover how they found a life of freedom. You can discover it too. I trust that you'll enjoy today's conversation between our host and our special guest. Thank you for listening and be sure to share the hope you hear and the mission of Victorious Living. When you talk about that experience where you were meditating and your body started reverberating and you, you saw the glory and you realized that God had chosen you. What was that like to know that you were chosen? Oh my goodness. I mean, I was, I mean, words can't describe it. I was running around going, I'm, you know, I'm called to serve him. I'm called to serve him. I mean, I think that you know, I'll never forget when I was growing up as a kid, I was, I was, you know, until I hit high school, I was always, you know, one of the biggest kids in my class, but I was, but my body was awkward because I hadn't, you know, fully grown into it. And so be, be, because of that, you know, man, I was always like one of the last kids picked for the team Mm -hmm. and it's painful to be like the last kid picked for the team or the kid not wanted on the team I mean that all changed you know and that you know and that didn't change until I like hit eighth eighth grade and then it all came together but and then when I get to high school and I become one of the best basketball players on the team and the coach tells me unless you play football I'm going to bench you from basketball because the varsity coach was the the JV varsity football coach was the JV basketball coach and every time I would do well he would bench me to teach me a lesson um and it was just so painful to feel man either I'm not chosen or you know I'm not counted you know you know uh, you know, I, I'm going to be made to ride the bench that like, I don't have something to contribute. I can help the team. And yet the coach doesn't see it. And the beautiful thing with Jesus is that, you know, he's the ultimate coach, the ultimate, you know, shepherd. And he's, you know, he, he, he chooses us and he chooses us not to sit on the bench. When he calls us, he calls us to get in the game and there's nothing like knowing that you've been chosen and called by the creator to get into the game and that he's with you uh, to make a difference in the world. And, And I think that's the thing that to me, like when I was in the music industry and working with all these famous people and, or when I've been around, you know, uh, my friends like with uh, extreme wealth and resources or with celebrities that I I've worked with even now, or all the opportunities we get to go into like mainstream media and different things like that. You know, one of the, what I realized that none, like none, nothing in life, no amount of money, no matter, matter of success, no amount of fame can compare to realizing that you've been used to make an impact in somebody's life and you've changed somebody's life. Amen. That is the, that, that is the ultimate, ultimate, in my opinion, joy. It is the ultimate success or feeling of success is not anything that I've ever earned, not everything that I've ever done, but it's 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 the lasting impact on people's lives and the relationships that result from that that's that's what matters that's what matters the most and do you believe everybody's been chosen yeah i believe every i believe god i believe he died for everyone 
And I believe everyone is called to come to the Lord so that they could enter into the chosen plan and purpose that he has for them. He extends the invitation, but we have to receive it. We have to make, we have to make that decision. We have to choose, you know, he's given us giftings and abilities. He's given every one of us influence because we have influence in the lives of the people that are around us at the very least. And I believe that, yeah, I believe that he does. And But I believe it's up to us to how we, if, if we, if, if we receive the call and receive the gift that he has for our lives. So, um, you talk a lot about not settling, about your half inheritance. And a lot of times, you know, you're talking about not settling for just the old Testament or the new Testament, but how about not settling in life for just yeah. a half relationship with, I mean, I don't know that you could have a half relationship, but just this no, me well, look. mediocre relationship with Jesus when we could have everything. Yeah. Look, I think that there's this, there's a saying in business don't leave any, don't leave money on the table. Hmm. And I think when Jesus dies, he pays such a high price and he doesn't want anything left on the table. He, he, he purchased eternal life for us. He purchased uh, not only eternal life, our forgiveness, but also he purchased our promise and potential. Hmm. And so I, I don't want to leave anything on the table. Right? He I, for the he paid such a high price so that we can have a deep intimate relationship with him and that we can be changed and transformed and and make an impact and make a mark in the world. I everything that he purchased I want in my life. When I when I die and 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 go on to be with God I don't want it to be said, man, you know, you could have done, you know, you, you, you could have done more. You could have had a greater impact. You could have been closer to me. Right. I want to, I want everything the Lord has for me. I don't want to settle uh, for less and I don't want to compromise for less. And I think often, I think oftentimes we do. I think oftentimes we do because we don't really think we're well, going go, go, going back to the story which I didn't I didn't finish the end, I didn't share the second part but when when God said to me listen he said you know go out and tell people you're my favorite son I said I can't do that and he said, Jason, it's not because you're afraid of what people might say. He goes, you don't really think I could love you enough that you could be my number one son. And I think that a big part of why we don't step into the fullness of what God has for us is we don't really God believe God could love us enough. We don't really believe that we have the value and the ability and we we struggle to see in ourselves what God sees in us, and it's hard for us. Oh, God really wants to talk to me. Look at who I am. Look at look at what I've done. God's going to really, you know, use me. I mean, listen, when I was in high school, my vice my the the principal of my school told my parents they thought I was likely to end up in in prison you know, or in trouble. I mean, I got in so much trouble, so many fights. I wound up dropping out of high school, got a GED, and then went on to get a master's. I mean, no one ever thought I would do something academically. No one ever thought that I'd write books that would become a New York Times bestsellers. I mean, no one, and I struggled like for years. I like didn't want to write books because I said, oh man, like I, I dropped out of school. I can't, I'm not a good writer. I'm not, you know, and I struggled kind of like Moses struggled. Oh God, you know, you're going to use me to go redeem the children of it, send somebody else. Like, I mean, I, I, I have a problem speaking. I got 
issues. Go, go send somebody else. And, you know, God tells Moses, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. Well, the word for shoes in Hebrew is the same word for lock, the lock on a door. And so taking off his shoes in part was saying, you got to remove those things, those false ways of seeing, those false ways of being that are locking you out of your destiny, out of your promise and potential. Stop may, stop looking at your faults. Stop looking at your failure. Stop, stop focusing on your weakness. You need to take off those things like you take off your shoes and understand that if you're connected to me, that doesn't matter. You know, wow. you, 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 you can do more, you can be more, but stop locking yourself out. Stop limiting yourself because, you know, with God, nothing is impossible. And so that's something that I've had to learn over time. There's many times when I don't feel like I get, you know, there's an opportunity that comes and I'm nervous. I'm like, oh man, am I up? Can I really do this? Um, am I, you know, and I, and, and you know, but, but in God, I can. Did you ever see yourself like on these major networks? Like I said, every, I turn, I'm like, that's my friend, God. <laughs> <laughs> then I turn this down, like, did my friend again. And I mean, what is it like sometimes to just think, wow. I mean, it's got to be so humbling to see. Is it ever scary? Like how yeah yeah i mean they're, 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 i mean certainly when i first started to do it it's scary there are certain big opportunities like when you go on like you know national television like you know let's say the today show or you go on different things like that or i i, I rapped on the dr oz show once i'm gonna look that up <laughs> you know so i i, I mean yeah. So, uh, yeah, those things were nervous. There are those opportunities that are big that still are nervous today. I think, I think number one, I've learned over the years to trust God that He's gonna He's gonna help that He's faith that He's faithful. So there's a faith and a trust um, in Him, but there. But there's def, you know, and and I also think that there is a reality that I've had to learn, like what's what's the worst that could happen. I I I don't do a great job on one thing, mm -hmm. you know. At the I think that's the thing. Like I think one of the things that I've had to learn to honestly, like I think in my family there was a legacy of fear and from 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 in my, in, in, among certain people in my family right because they had lost so many so much of our family in the holocaust and just different things like that there was this you know and i had and i wrestled with some of that fear in my own life i think everyone wrestles with fear i think fear can be an ac acronym for false evidence appearing real like usually the thing that we fear is not as real as we think it is. And I think, you know, it's like the disciples in John 21 were fishing all night and they caught nothing like we talked about in the new book. And the word for fish and the word for fear has the same root in Hebrew. Because when you live from a place of fear, your nets and your life is left to you empty. And so I think fear will rob you. Fear will cause you to lock yourself in the upper room like the disciples did after the death of Jesus. Fear will rob you of your promise. Fear will rob you of your destiny. And, you know, it's easy to live in fear, you know, but I think I've had to learn that failure, trying and failing is better than living in fear. <laughs> Because the reality is, is that you are going to fail at certain things. There are going to be certain things that you do that are not going to succeed. But the reality is, is that you will never succeed if you don't step out in faith and try. Yeah. You got to take risks in life. You got to take faith. Faith is spelled R-I-S-K. 
and, and there, again, there's been times throughout the ministry where you have to make a conscious choice to move from fear to faith. There's been many times in our ministry where we didn't know God called us to do something and we had no idea where the money was coming from. We didn't have enough money to keep the lights on, to pay people. Um, and yet, even if it was at the 11th hour, God always came through. And so I think it's important to look back. I think, I think the important thing is that the, the, like when you read the Bible, one of the things that the Bible is, is a testimony to us. Mm -hmm. And the Hebrew word for testimony in Hebrew is, comes from the same root as the Hebrew word again. Mm -hmm. Because a testimony is something God wants to do again and again. He's the God of the again. And so what God did for the people in the Bible, he wants to do for you. But also, when you hear other people's testimonies about what God has did, like in our day and time in their life, again, it's not just a nice story about something he did. It's something he wants to do again in your life because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's part of the reason why God always says, remember. God wants us to keep a remembrance of the things he's done in our life because that becomes a testimony. And as you kind of remember, oh man, God was with me with this, God helped me with that, over time, it begins to build your faith and it gives you the faith to step out and do things that naturally you would be fearful or scared of doing because you're like, man, you know, God was with me that time. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to believe he's going to be with me this time as well. And I believe his, his word that testifies to the fact that he works all things out together for good. So that even when I went through those difficult times, that's the beauty of walking with the Lord. Even the most difficult, even the greatest, most tragic experiences that we go through in our lives in jesus they're not pointless mm -hmm. but god uses them to prepare us and so you know you know you know god can bring gain even out of our pain he can bring blessing out of our brokenness he can bring life out of our loss and in fact that's the only way it comes there has to you know jesus had to die before there could be life and there's parts of us that have to die there's pieces of our life that have to be dead for god to raise up the new things you know in our life so we can choose like we can choose to focus on the loss we can choose to focus on the pain or we can choose to try and we could, or we could choose to turn to Lord and say, Lord, bring purpose out of the pain, redeem what I've been through and use it to change my life. Because I'd say that I, I have, I have, I have grown and matured and become a better person and become a better leader based on the difficult things in life that I had to face and work through. It's like going to the gym. You don't get bigger muscles unless there's resistance, unless the muscle breaks down, unless there's some sort of pain, unless it's difficult. And so you're not going to grow in the physical or in the spiritual or you know, into the fullness of your promise and potential without the struggle, without the hardships. That's just the way it's designed. And Jesus himself wasn't immune from that. He was tested in every way. He was tried in every way. He experienced rejection. He experienced, you know, everything imaginable for us 
And he doesn't ask us to go through anything he wasn't willing to go through himself. He was innocent and yet was convicted and received capital punishment. He knows what it means to be labeled a criminal. He knows what it means to be imprisoned. He knows what it means to be rejected. And he went through all of that to empathize with our pain to under and 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 to ultimately free us from it so that we could understand and find eternal life but also to understand that we have a redeemer we have a god who we can come before him and 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 knowing that he gets us amen and he still chooses us nonetheless. And he still chooses us nonetheless. And I think that's a beautiful thing. It's like, again, part of the problem is that we have, our, our ability to see is limited. And the truth is, you'll never be more than you can see. We have the ability to look at our lives and to see the worse or to see the faults and the weaknesses. But Jesus sees differently. Mm -hmm. So like when you look at the people that he chose, you know, one was a gangster, Simon the Zealot. One was a hater judas who stabbed them in the back and sold him out right ratted him out to the authorities mm -hmm. you know to the you know you have one was a one was a doubter thomas one was a denier peter and so you look at like these guys he chose like he didn't chose the harvard people he didn't chose the the elites of his day that he didn't, you know, he chose these ragtag bunch of individuals. Why? Because he could see in them what they couldn't see in themselves. Mm -hmm. And God sees more in each one of us than what we can be. And God doesn't see us for what we've done or for even who we are. He sees us for who we have the potential to become. And so we need to ask Jesus to say, Lord, how do you see me? Amen. And that changes everything. I think one of the most powerful things when we were on um, at the Sea of Galilee and you were teaching and you talked about how those disciples, when he said, come and follow me, and they immediately left their nets, that they were, I never thought about that they were younger teenagers, maybe, but they hadn't made the cut to the rabbinical school. Yeah. And so they were, like you said, the ragtag. They were the ones that didn't make the team. And to me, that was one of the most beautiful things. Um, I actually shared that part with our incarcerated family, um, you know, that that's why they just dropped everything and followed him. Cause like the rabbi of all rabbis had just said, come, I choose you to be on my team. And um, I just, like you said, that changes everything to know that he is, uh, he's chosen us. And I, um, I did want to ask you this when you, you've blessed me so much <laughs> more than you could ever know just from our trip, from your teachings, but just even just hearing your journey. Uh, Cause I don't think people realize it is hard, you know, how hard it is. And um, people can just see the good things and the opportunities God has opened before you not realizing the pain and the wrestling that you've done at night and the tears and like wait until that 11th hour clinging on to your faith and saying, God, I know you're, you're, I remember what you've done. I remember you're going to do it again. Um, but I did want to go back to just one thing when you were talking about being in New York and working with all of these celebrities and the rap industry mm -hmm. and all of that. And 
you looked at all these people that had so much, but yet you thought there has to be more. And I think that's your your favorite word that there's more, there's always more. But I think that's kind of where it started. You look, it's like, there's got to be more. And what was it that you saw lacking? Like, what did you feel? Like I try to help people say, well, that's how I feel too. I felt like, okay, if I have success, I'm going to have enough. If I'm in the in crowd and you got all these people that are famous, but yet it wasn't enough, or you could see in them, or is it you saw in them, it wasn't enough? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I think that, I think like, I think there's a lie that says, I'll be happy when I make it. I'll be happy when I achieve this level of success and people know who I am and I was, and I have money and I have the things that I want. And, you know, I saw how these people had, you know, fame and fortune but I saw that there was still an emptiness there. There was still, uh, you know, and I saw them, you know, saw them doing drugs in front of their kids. And I saw them taking, ripping people off. And I saw them lying and just doing things that were like, you know, deceptive and manipulative. And, and I realized that, man, there's no amount of success that can make you feel good about who you are or make you secure in your worth and your value and identity it doesn't matter how many screaming fans that you have that that can't come externally it has to come internally mm -hmm. and it, it there has to be a spiritual basis for it and i saw that no matter how much money you had that you can't buy love, that you can't buy happiness, that that there is the void in our soul and we're trying to fill it. We're trying to fill the hurt. We're trying to fill the, the desires. We're trying to fill that, you know, take away that sense of loneliness, mm -hmm. that sense of fear, that sense of struggling for our value, not feeling worthy and i and i realized that you know what like it wasn't going to be found in your possessions it wasn't going to be found in your possessions it wasn't going to be found in fame or fortune none of that stuff could really fill the hole and fill those the, the 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 most the most things the things that we long for and desire the most and that's and when you started seeking and it. that's when i started to seek on a spiritual level and and i'd say that like it's it's still important because it's like it's very easy to think that um my value or my worth comes because man i i have this uh, ministry I, I i get to write books i get to do media like like what i realize is like at the end of the day all of that is not it, it, again it, it's it's not none of that can be what defines my identity it has to come from who god says i am and my relationship with him at the end of the day, it's relationship that matters. We're created for connection. Redemption was for the sake of relationship. That's what matters. You can have everything in the world, but if you have no, no one to share it with, or you can't, or you, you know, what does it mean? So that's what I had to learn. My meaning comes from my relationship, relationship with God and relationship with the people around me. Amen. Thank you for watching our broadcast. Are you an incarcerated brother or sister who needs encouragement? Write to us at Victorious Living Correspondents, P.O. Box 2751, Greenville, North Carolina, 27836, or email us at hope at vlmag.org. To view Victorious Living Magazine in its entirety, 
please have your chaplain contact us at 352-478-2098 or email us through our website at vlmag.org. We are happy to provide our Victorious Living magazine free of charge in bulk with or without staples.